An associate of mine once wrote on the importance of preserving culinary history that culturally important foods are just as worthy of preservation as any church or courthouse. And while my own personal knowledge on the topic is limited, we have reached a point in the history of the Kingmaker Diamond where it is necessary to delve briefly into the gastronomic history of the VSR, as this chapter begins with a visit to some of Crystal City's finest dining establishments, some of which are still open in the present day. The culinary community of Crystal City in the early 20th century was a very tight-knit one, owing mainly to its relationship to the former rulers of the land. The last generation of royal Valorian cooks had a camaraderie not unlike soldiers in battle, because the De Rosiers were famously difficult people to cook for. Tycho lived in constant paranoia that his food was poisoned, and as such would refuse to eat anything that had been seasoned. Meanwhile, Clara had a number of digestive issues and was known to go through long periods of fasting where she would eat nothing but raw cucumber and ice cubes. Their children, likewise, were often called the pickiest eaters in the country. Princess Isadora, the second oldest, was in particular said to have a palate so sensitive that she could taste if her chicken schnitzel had been prepared in the same room as a single leaf of spinach. Naturally, every person who worked in the castle kitchen despised the De Rosier family, and on the night of the February Revolt, nobody was cheering harder than the kitchen staff when the dead bodies of the royal family were dragged out into the street and burned. When the Feverites took over, and all the business owners who opposed their goals had either been imprisoned or killed, it was many years before the country's economy was stable enough to make restaurants and hotels viable businesses again. As such, many of the royal cooks found themselves struggling to find employment. But because of the closeness of the bonds they had formed with each other by that point, they all made solemn vows to support and uplift each other in all future endeavors. This was how the Dumbwaiter Fraternity was formed. The Dumbwaiter Fraternity began as an unofficial union of former royal cooks and waitstaff but evolved over time to become a secret society that incorporated the majority of chefs, innkeepers, waitstaff, and restaurateurs in Crystal City. If anyone in the dumbwaiter fraternity required advice on business matters, a reference on a job interview, a hard-to-find ingredient, or any other information or service that only a fellow member of the culinary profession could provide, they needed only ask a fellow member of the fraternity. One such member, who proved immensely useful through his access to international smuggling routes, was Telesphore Winterlinch. Trust me, if you need to find anyone in Crystal City, someone in my network of contacts will know where they are. It's a big city, certainly, but we need only pinpoint the location of Ariadne's favorite tea room or patisserie, and that will immediately narrow down the search area. Where do we start? Well, it's hard to tell since we know very little about Ariadne. I suppose we could start anywhere. Any suggestions? Well, my vote is for that patisserie on Mulwasser. You know, the one that does the really good pretzels. But, Colette, since this trip is all for you, I think you ought to get first pick. Oh, come on. Don't put me on the spot. It's been so long since I've been to Crystal City. I don't remember there really being restaurants when I lived here. Ah, uh, of course not. I sometimes forget you're a child of the 80s. It would have all still been soup kitchens and bread lines when you were living here. It's a shame your father sent you away when he did, because you've missed 12 years of culinary revitalization. We've got our pick of establishments to begin our investigation. The only thing I'll request is that we shouldn't go to Brasserie Inesco just yet. I'm already planning on going there at 3.30 today. The proprietor is my dear friend Marie-Georges, and that's the time of our bi-monthly coffee date. I plan on interviewing her then. After much deliberation, the trio decided to stop at the Golden Violin, a bistro known for their lavish desserts and extensive a la carte lunch menu. The Golden Violin had only been open for three years by 1911, but in the time since, it has become a Crystal City institution. I had the pleasure of dining at the Golden Violin once in 1976, and I can safely say that I have never eaten a better croque monsieur in my life. Welcome to the Golden Violin. How many are in your party? Three, but we're not here to eat. I'd like to speak to Chef Edgar. In 1911, the establishment's head chef was a man by the name of Antonin Edgar, who 25 years ago had been a humble kitchen hand for the royal family, often working the same shifts as Telesfor. 
The maitre d', however, was less familiar with Talus IV, and thus needed to test him with the traditional coded phrase by which members of the fraternity knew each other. One can never have too much salt. But you can have too much pepper. The two of them nodded to each other, then exchanged the secret handshake of the dumbwaiter fraternity, which I am for legal reasons not allowed to describe. I'll go fetch him for you. Please, take a seat. The cloakroom is to your left. Thank you. So what's the plan? Once Edgar's free to chat, I'll ask him if Ariadne ever comes in here, and if he says no, I'll ask him to phone a few of our friends. If anyone else has seen her, Edgar can take a message and let us know later. In the meantime, I say we should order some lunch. The croque monsieur here is to die for. I was actually looking at the... The... Um... But rest assured. Hello, Arthur de Colette. Colette had frozen in fear because she'd just seen something out of her worst nightmares. At the table directly next to them was her father, Axel Geis, smiling and enjoying ice cream parfaits with Colette's stepmother, Vida, and to her shock, two children who seemed about 10 years old. That's my dad. Who? Him? Yeah. Now that both of them were staring, it was only a matter of time before Axel noticed them. After her escape from St. Rita's in 1901, Axel had not seen his daughter once. However, he had been thinking of her recently, as police from Champignon had come to his house asking if he knew where she was. Colette, what are you doing here? Answer me when I'm speaking to you. You know the police are looking for you, right? They came to my house about a month ago asking if I'd seen you. So what have you done this time? I'm just having lunch with my friends, Dad. You mean these two men? <sighs> I can't say I'm even surprised anymore. I have to go. Mr. Winterlich, Chef Edgar is ready to see you. Certainly. Darling, could you... I'll take care of her, don't worry. I have a feeling this will take a while. Maybe you should keep searching without us. We'll reconvene after my appointment with Marie-Georges. As he left the golden violin, Eisen flicked his wrist in the direction of Colette's stepfamily, covertly casting a spell over Axel's parfait spoon that caused it to fling whipped cream into his face. Jesus. When Eisen found Colette, she was sat crying by a pond in nearby Citadel Green, a park just off Antwerp Boulevard, which served as a popular place for the children of Crystal City to race miniature sailboats. It had been a place where Colette and her mother, Milena, had spent a great deal of time in her youth, and it was one of the only nearby places in Crystal City where Colette felt somewhat at peace. Hey. Hey. Take a deep breath, okay? We have to keep a low profile, so try not to, you know, blow anything up. <laughs> Hey, come here. Come on, come here. You'll be okay. I was fine never knowing what my family were doing without me, but now... Listen, don't let it get to you. That's the shitty thing about Crystal City. Everyone ends up here eventually, so there's always a chance you'll run into someone you never wanted to see again. Hands where I could see them. You see? Happens to the best of us. Aaron Gottlieb, who you may remember from the prologue of this history, was a decorated and venerated member of the Feverite party. He'd been involved in the ransacking of Crystal Castle in 1886 and had fought against the monarchy alongside Eisen. The two men had once been friends, and Eisen had even built the automatic pistol attachment for Gottlieb's mechanical prosthetic hand. Unfortunately, once the Feverites had been in power for a few years, Eisen's disregard for authority only became more pronounced, leading to quite a dramatic falling out, and Eisen quitting his government job entirely. In the years following, Eisen had, of course, taken up with Telus IV in the smuggling business, while Gottlieb had been promoted to chief of police. Gottlieb, old mate, how's the police force treating you? Pretty well, considering I apprehended one of the country's most elusive smugglers and its most wanted murderer in one fell swoop. Murderer? Since when? You know killing people's against my religion. Not you, jackass. Your girlfriend. All right, because of the, uh... The Thea thing. Yeah. 
Someone over at the Golden Violin called in a tip. I came here looking for her, but it looks like God's smiling down on me today because you just also happen to be here, Iyer. Aaron, my friend, I would love to. You know I would, but unfortunately, I'm gonna have to. <laughs> Eisen's attempt to damage Gottlieb's gun hand was entirely unsuccessful. Oh, for, oh God damn it. <laughs> you really think I'd be walking around with a mechanical hand in my line of work and not put some anti-artificer wards on it? You've lost your edge, Eisen. Now I'll ask you again. By order of the Crystal City Metropolitan Police, under Section 46 of the Valerian National Arrest Act, hands where I can see them. Colette and Eisen were loaded into the back of Gottlieb's police wagon and delivered post-haste to the Crystal City Jailhouse to be detained until the time came for a judge to decide their punishment. It bears mentioning that the judge at this time was Heinrich Lutz, another one of Eisen's former associates. Just like Gottlieb's hand, every part of the prison's construction was treated with an anti-artificer ward, which meant that once Colette and Eisen were thrown in their cell, there was no getting out without the key. Have a nice rest of your life. My father called in that tip to the police. I just know it. Ah, he seemed like a bastard. He is. I always got along better with my mother. I used to think my father just didn't want kids, but he seems real happy with his new ones. Guess he just didn't like me. I mean, that was partially my fault. I was not well behaved, especially after mom died. When dad introduced me to his new wife, instead of saying, how do you do, I bit her. She had to get stitches. Wow, so you were always a little shit then. Excuse me? I mean, it makes sense that you were a feral child. You have the ears of one. What's that supposed to mean? Exactly what you think it does. But I see it with a degree of affection, believe me. Oi, isn't it customary for prisoners to get a phone call? For most, yes. But for defectors who think they're better than us, <laughs> no way in hell. What about murderers? You don't need one. Someone's already paid your bail. Wait, really? Yeah, lucky you. Here she is, ma'am. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so sorry for the trouble she's caused you. At first, Colette didn't recognize the woman who had come to pick her up, but after a while she realized that if she had seen this woman 13 years ago, she would have looked very familiar indeed. M mom Yes, Letty, it's me. I'll explain everything once we're out of here. Let's just get you home. But you're dead. <laughs> That's what Axel told you, isn't it? Typical. I've been writing you letters once a month, but I guess he must have gotten rid of them. He always was the vindictive type. You know, he didn't even tell me he'd sent you to that awful school. I had to find out when the police came around asking after you. Why would he lie about that? I told you! I'll explain when we're out of here. Now, come along. Outside the jail, the two women shared a long overdue and very deserved hug before getting in a taxi and heading off. I was having an affair with one of my co-workers, so your father threw me out. I hope you won't think less of me for it. Oh, no. Never. I mean, maybe at the time I would have, but as an adult, I can see why you did it. <laughs> now, I didn't want to have to ask, but... About those murder charges. It's not a cut and dry thing. It was an accident. We don't have to talk about it right now. I can tell you're tired. Ugh, I am tired. Here, lay your head on my shoulder. We're almost there. Colette lay her head on her mother's shoulder and felt instantly comforted. It was as if none of the business with the Kingmaker or her father had ever happened and she was a carefree young girl again. She let her eyes drift out of the taxi window and watched the surroundings change from houses and shops to warehouses and factories. Above it all was the imposing, glittering shape of Crystal Castle, 
which loomed closer with every turn the taxi took. Mom? Yes, Letty? Where are we going? I just have to take care of something. Mom? Yes? Why can't I move? Shh. Don't worry about it. Just relax. Mother's here. Colette suddenly found herself feeling very tired. So tired, in fact, that she couldn't keep her eyes open, even though she knew by now there was something very, very wrong. She looked up at her mother, searching for guidance. Milena said nothing. She merely gave Colette a knowing smirk before removing a glass eye from her right eye socket. When Colette awoke, the first thing she noticed was that she felt immensely well rested. The second thing she noticed was that she was on a surgical table with a large, menacing electrical apparatus pointing towards her. <laughs> Welcome home, Letty. You're in the sub-basement of Crystal Castle, and this is the Arm Brilliant. Here's some food for thought for next time. Don't blindly trust anyone claiming to be your dead mother. Need I remind you that I can shapeshift? What you did to my eye made it a little harder, but a well-made glass replacement can work in a pinch. If you're going to take the Kingmaker, you can take it. I never wanted it in the first place. Just take it back and let me go. No, I don't think I will. See, I realized something around the time you left me in a cloud of dirt and petrol fumes at the German border. It's not worth the trouble. When treated correctly and charged with the right kind of energy, any Kersite of crystal can be used to power a death ray. Case in point, this unassuming little unicorn statue. Hey, Morris paid us to steal that. And who do you think asked him for it? It was expensive, but worth it. Just like my revenge on you will be. Oh, it'll be so satisfying to destroy you. You'll be the first person I use the new, revitalized Arm Brilliant on. Then, once you're dead, I'll remove the Kingmaker from the pile of dust that used to be your body, and then there will be nothing to stop me from installing my son on the throne. Look, I'm sorry I took your eye out. I really am, but was all this really necessary? Toying with my emotions, pretending to be my mother? As my flawless performance should have proven, I'm a fantastic mother. You and I could have genuinely bonded if you'd married Leonid. We could have been a real family. But you just weren't quick enough to take my deal, so now, unfortunately, you don't get nice Ariadne. You don't deserve her. You hardly gave me the time to think. Marriage is a big decision! Especially when it's with a man I've never even seen a photograph of. Oh, you want to see him? Fine. Since you're about to die for his sake, I suppose you can. Leonid, darling. Yes, Mother, what do you... <gasps> mother! I thought you said you weren't going to use the ray on people unless they attacked us first! Leo, this is not the time for you to play Bleeding Heart. Say hello to Colette. Hello, Colette. Wait, 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 that's Colette? What on earth is she doing on your torture table? I told you, she didn't agree to our terms, so I'm killing her. Remember we said we were doing that? No, we had that whole discussion on the way to the old lady's house about how killing and maiming isn't the only solution. And now what are you doing? You're getting ready to kill and maim. My wife, no less. She's not your wife, sweetie. Hearing that, Colette's survival instincts kicked in, prompting her to say something that she never thought she would have said in her life. Not yet, anyway. I mean, now that I've seen you, Leonid, your mother was right. You're a catch. I am. Thank you. Leo, don't listen to her. She's just buttering you up so she can try to escape. Normally, I know you're very smart, but you'll have to trust my instincts on this one. I've tortured hundreds of people. They always try and say what you want them to when they know they're going to die. Yes, yes. Oh, I was the greatest torturer this country's ever seen. We know. Give it a rest for ten minutes and let her go. You're going to regret asking me to do that, honey. She'll run as soon as her feet are on the ground. Mother, when I'm king, 
I'll be your boss, so you better learn to trust my judgment every once in a while. How about we make a compromise? Colette can come with me on a day, and if she tries to run, or if we just find that we can't see a future together, then I'll bring her back to you, and you can do whatever it is you're trying to do. That sounds perfect. I'd love to. Could either of you tell me what time it is? It's about 3.30. Wonderful. I know just the place you should take me, Leonid. You'll love it. It's called Brasserie Ionesco. Just as she had hoped, Telus 4 was still having his bi-monthly coffee date with Marie-Georges. They had been catching each other up on all the fresh work gossip, and the topic had not yet turned to the subject of Ariadne's whereabouts. And he just invited himself to the family's garden party, even though she told him it was a family-only event. Oh, that is so like him. Always sticking his nose where it is needed. And that's not the worst part. While he was there, he tried to propose. No. Yes. <laughs> Now, you said something about wanting information on somebody. Oh yes, in fact, I was going to ask. Telesfor was just about to ask about Ariadne, but he was distracted by the arrival of Colette at the door of the restaurant, with Leonid in tow. He watched them with interest as they were led to a table and took their seats. My apologies, but I've got to attend to something. You wouldn't happen to have any spare uniforms in my size, would you? The ski instructor said that slope was way too dangerous, but I was like, come on, how hard is it to go in a straight line down a hill? Gravity does most of the work, right? <laughs> Luckily, Mother was there to repair all the compound fractures, or they probably would have had to amputate my leg. <laughs> Good afternoon. Have you had a chance to peruse the menu? Colette went to take a sip from her complimentary cucumber water, but when she spotted Telus Four dressed in a waiter's uniform, she nearly choked. She didn't dare make a scene, though. If Leonid suspected anything was out of place, he'd be likely to drag her back to his mother. We have, thank you. I haven't. I'll order for you. <laughs> oh, so forward. Colette gave Telus Four a pointed look before she began ordering. In order to avoid the suspicions of her would-be suitor, she decided the only way to try and express the nature of her situation was through her order. Telus Four got the idea fairly quickly. Will anyone else be joining you this evening, or will it just be the two of you? Just the two of us. It's our first date. Congratulations. May I tempt you with some aperitifs? We have a new specialty cocktail called the Indian Artificer. Did you spot it on the menu? No, thank you, sir. The last time I had a drink that strong, I ended up spending the night in jail. Wait, what's in it? Never mind, you can just get me a gin and tonic with an extra lemon wedge. Yes, sir, of course. And for the mademoiselle? Do you know how to make a one-eyed monarchist? I believe so, but you might need to jog my memory. It was invented right here in Crystal City. In Crystal Castle, in fact. It's got a base of red wine. I'm, I'm sure you have some in the cellar. Well, of course. Where else would they keep the wine? Something like a Chateau de Armbrillant. So, for drinks to clarify, a gin and tonic with extra lemon for Monsieur, and for Mademoiselle, the one-eyed monarchist a la Crystal Castle, with the Armbrillant from the cellar. Exactly. The cocktails here have such weird names. I know, right? <clears throat> and then, as entrees, I think we'll split a plate of the Palissons de Courgette. And for mains, I will have the Cive de Serfone, and he will have the ham and cheese Flemcucha. We'll decide on desserts later. An excellent choice. I'll be back with your drinks in just a moment. What an odd waiter. Agreed. So, tell me about yourself. Oh, God. Really? Yeah, I mean, we are going to be married. We ought to get acquainted. Jeez. <laughs> what is there to know? You probably already know all of it if you've talked to Nanette, the gossipy old hen. I'm being mean. No, I love her. I love Nanette. Mother did most of the talking to her. I, I wasn't really listening. Oh, <laughs> Lucky me. Well, I guess I was born here, and, uh, 
My birthday is Konigstodestag. I was an apprentice tailor for ten years, but then I blew up my boss. I like music and sewing. I read books on occasion. I don't have real hobbies. I just kind of exist. That's so fun, because I actually have lots of hobbies. I ski, as I already told you, and I collect train sets and matchbooks, and I'm in the process of learning pyromancy. In fact, Garcon, where the hell is our waiter? I need some matches. I want to show you a trick I can do. You don't carry your own matches? No. Mother checks my pockets for them before I leave the house. She says she has to, all because I burnt down one lousy tree at the botanical gardens. Like, yeah, it was an extremely rare St. Helena mountain bush that's extinct in the wild or whatever, but come on, it's a plant. They don't have souls, who cares? Do you mind if I go powder my nose? I'll be right back. Just don't take too long. And don't try to escape. I won't. <laughs> Colette, as casually as possible, made her way to the back of the restaurant, looking for not the ladies' room, but the kitchen. Tell us four. Tell us four. Where are you? Excuse me. You wouldn't happen to know Tell us four, would you? Is that the name of your corpulent friend who was playing waiter with you earlier? <gasps> I've been watching you, and I know what you're getting at. You're trying to sneak away to that hideous motor vehicle again. You know you'll break Leonid's heart if you do that. Well, Top, what are you going to do? Kidnap me again in front of all these witnesses? That was precisely what she did. Ah! She wrestled Colette's arms behind her back and held them tight. Then, stretching her fingers out into a long rope, she tied both of Colette's wrists together. I hope you enjoyed your last taste of freedom. Leo, come here, we're leaving. Mother! I told you to stop spying on my dates. I know, and I'm sorry, but this is a special circumstance. What about our food? Your order never got to the kitchen, sweetie. The waiter was her friend in disguise. I'll get you some gin and a flamacucha later, after I kill her. Will you cut the crust off? Of course, my darling. Now come and help me hijack a taxi. I'm down one usable hand. Meanwhile, while this was happening, Eisen was still languishing in jail. Gottlieb had long since returned to his post because, as chief of police, he had much more important things to do than indulge in schadenfreude. At that moment, in fact, my research indicates that he was on the other side of the city, planting incriminating items in the office of one of the candidates in the upcoming presidential election. All right, mate. Time for your supper. Oh, lucky me. Just what I was craving. Gruel... And hard tack. Are you Eisen, are you? Who's asking, like? One can never have too much salt. What? Eisen looked down at his plate and saw that, sticking up out of his ration of porridge, was a large piece of metal wire. Compliments of Mr. Winterly. Normally, this would be quite a distressing sight, as it would present a significant choking hazard. But to Eisen, it was his ticket out. The bars of the doors and windows may have been treated with anti-artifice awards, but the wire hadn't, and with the right amount of shaping, it became the perfect tool for picking the lock the old-fashioned way. Of course, that left the issue of being spotted by the guards, however Eisen still had a trick up his sleeve. Crystal City's prison was a grand stone building with wide, straight corridors, high vaulted ceilings, and smooth limestone walls. It was designed specifically to be hard to escape from, with very few places to hide, but the architects had perhaps not considered that there would still be blind spots in what the guards would be able to see, namely, what was directly on the ceiling above them. <laughs> These anti-gravity boots are really paying for themselves. Did you say something? It wasn't me. Outside, once he had crawled out of a skylight and made his way down to ground level, Eisen found Telus Fall waiting for him in the van. Upon being reunited, the two embraced and shared a long, passionate kiss. The reason behind this action is still the subject of much historical debate. <sighs> tell us, for you're a lifesaver. What did I tell you? The dumbweight of fraternity look out for each other, and I look out for you. Where's Colette? On a date with Ariadne's son. They're holding her hostage. 
she has a son. And I thought she was bad enough on her own. I would have assumed she couldn't have kids. She seems like she's got teeth down there. That's the least of our worries. When the date goes bad, which it no doubt will, Colette's going to be dragged back to Ariadne's current lair in the basement of the castle. Ariadne has the arm brilliant. That'll be sub-basement three. We put the arm brilliante down there after the revolution in case we were ever invaded and needed to use it. She must be planning on taking the Kingmaker right away. And likely scooping poor Miss Geiss's brain out in order to do so. So, no big deal then. I broke the arm brilliante once, I can do it again. Love the optimism, darling. I think now it may be valuable to actually describe the construction of the arm brillante. The weapon was designed in the early 1800s by Diethelm de Rosier, grandfather of Tycho, with the help of the City Artificers Guild. The first and only energy weapon of its calibre ever designed, the Arme Brilliant had resembled a human-sized telescope made of brass and iron, fitted on the front end with a series of lenses that connected to various electrical parts, and at the back end with an electrified glass dome locked under a cage, designed to hold the Kingmaker and channel its great destructive power. It released a beam that could be any width and could be turned upon any target the user desired. Right now, Ariadne had the aperture on its smallest setting and had pointed the arm brilliance focal lens squarely at Colette's heart. If Ariadne hadn't been occupied by arguing with her son, Colette likely would have been dead. Do you see why you have to listen to me? Because what did I say would happen? Exactly this. I said she'd try and run, and she did. You've got to stop being so naive if you want to be an effective diplomat. Stop being a backseat monarch. I know that, Mother. I'm not dumb. I totally would have noticed that Colette was running away, even if you weren't there. You know what? Let's talk about it later. We'll talk about it later, after the girl is dead and we've gone upstairs and slaughtered Parliament. Again with the killing! (laughs) Get used to it. I am used to it because you do it all the time! You are so predictable! What are you going to do when there's a war? You're going to have to stop thinking killing is predictable then. Because that's what people do when there's a war. Well, there's not going to be a war. Because I'm going to be too good of a king for there to be one. There's going to be one. France and Russia are conspiring. Italy and the Ottomans are feuding. Austria-Hungary can barely control its colonies. And Britain and Germany are in an arms race. And we are right in the center of that. Ugh, I sent you to that expensive British private school, and you didn't even learn enough to interpret current affairs. Well, obviously, we'll just use the arm brilliant to kill all the invading armies. Like how they did back in the last war. Whatever that war was called. You know the one. (sighs) I wish they'd just kill me. From the top of the staircase leading into the sub-basement, Eisen and Telesphore watched Ariadne and Leonid arguing and plotted their course of action. Oh, you can tell that's the king's son. He inherited his father's pig-headedness. And his hairline. That's unfortunate. We'll attack this thing just like when we robbed that art museum in Antwerp. I think if I crawl across the ceiling beam there, I'll be in a perfect position to disable the arm brilliante. Eh, and you have your gun, right? Just the revolver. Oh, well, if I distract her, do you think you'd be able to get close without her noticing? And remember... Headshot or nothing. Naturally. Ah, I love you, man. Likewise. I'm not letting you distract me anymore, Leonid. I'm turning on the arm brilliant right now. Whatever you want, I guess. But I'm not sticking around to watch. Fine. What was that? Eisen! Who the hell are you? Oh, ho, ho, that's right. We've never been properly introduced. My name's Ayer. Ring any bells? Is it supposed to? Let me jog your memory. September 2nd, 1881. You killed two people who went by that name, a husband and a wife. They were socialist organisers who wouldn't give the king the information he wanted. That certainly sounds like something I would do. <laughs> You have to forgive me. That far back, it all blurs together. I think you underestimate how many people I've killed. Allow me to correct you on that front. Oh, by all means, try your best. (laughs) (coughs) 
Hold on. Aren't there three of you? She's there, and you're here, so that means... <laughs> ah. There's the third one. What happened to headshot or nothing? It's less effective when I'm expecting it. <clears throat> so, you're one of our good neighbors. That explains a lot. But not why you're acting against the proper order. You and I should be on the same side. Don't make assumptions about me. <clears throat> Despite the quite stark size difference between Ariadne and Telesphor, she was more than able to hold her own in a fight. Not content with just causing pain to others through magic, Ariadne also practiced jujitsu in her spare time, which was a growing trend among single women during the early 1900s. Fool. <laughs> Oi, you've left your hostage unattended. You're still here? I almost forgot. <laughs> and then there's you, Colette. Why have you been tagging along with these two anyway? For protection? <laughs> Some good that did you. They're pathetic. Though, like attracts like, I suppose. Even if you do kill me, your death ray is broken. So what will it even matter? Silence! Ariadne grabbed Colette's head and held it down, preparing to sever it once and for all. Perhaps it was a mistake to trust technology. But no matter. There will be other artificers to fix it. Just as there were other crystals to power it. As Colette lay prone and awaiting her beheading, she started quietly reciting the Lord's Prayer to herself, which led her to an interesting realization. Her facial muscles weren't paralyzed, and Ariadne's finger was very close to her mouth. Ow! That drew blood, you little brat! All right. Just for that, I'm going to kill you slowly. Well, what if instead... I kill you! Fastly! What? Oh no. Don't you dare! Ariadne narrowly managed to run for cover, ducking behind the arm brilliant. Fortunately for her, the mechanism was able to absorb most of the blast, but unfortunately for everyone else... Oh, my back. Shit. What happened? It's gonna blow. Nice work, Diamond Heat. You've overcharged the mechanism and set off a chain reaction. Is Ariadne dead, at least? I'm at a weird angle. I can't see anything. If only you were so lucky. Ah! Perhaps Colette hadn't been able to land a blow on Ariadne. But she was still supremely lucky in the sense that right as Ariadne was about to impale her with her sharpened ulna... <laughs> She was bifurcated by one of the Arm Brilliant's pneumatic pipes, which had split open and flown off due to a rapid increase of pressure. Son of a bitch. Colette, are you alright? I'm in one piece, but the paralysis spell is still wearing off. Telsey, how quick can you get over here if I'm looking away? Immediately. Good. Take care of her. My arms are tired. I'm not that heavy. Well, excuse me. I have been crawling upside down on ceilings all day, and I've just got this shit kicked out of me. I am exhausted. Oh, get a room, you two. Thanks. Wait. Wait, where's Ariadne? Didn't she just get cut in half? Ah, uh, it wasn't a headshot, but I don't think she'll have gone far in her condition. If I can beat her to the door... I think that might be inadvisable. Let's get out of here before we're all reduced to atoms. Eisen, come on! Meanwhile, in the upper levels of Crystal Castle, the Valorian Parliament was in the middle of a meeting. None of them had a clue of their potential destruction occurring in the sub-basement beneath them. Then I think all of us agree that if Alice Through the Looking Glass is ever allowed to be sold in the VSR, it will be in a heavily edited form. We cannot have our children reading it and thinking it's okay to travel between dimensions. Now, Minister LaBelle, I believe you have the floor next. Some new legislation about going to war with the creators of the mysterious invisible blue landmines, no doubt. No, actually. 
I was going to bring up the fact that we can cut our roads infrastructure budget by 20% by using an artificial pitch-based compound with a lower melting point. The research my age got in from France has shown us that the roads over there are... Was that an earthquake? Did anyone else see a bright blue flash? Ah! I was right! Everyone evacuate now! Head to the exit! Luckily for everyone on the ground, the strong stone masonry of the castle's basement was able to resist damage from the Armbrelliant's self-destruction, but the brunt of the force from the explosion was funneled straight up. So the upper levels, which were mainly made of treated glass, were not so impervious. Forty government employees, including a few parliamentary officials who had been unfortunate enough to be using the men's lavatories on the second floor, were vaporised within seconds, and serious damage was done to many of the castle's load-bearing walls. After this, Crystal Castle would have to undergo construction for the second time in 25 years. This time, the Feverites decided to use stone instead of glass, which many would argue they should have just made the castle out of in the first place. Everyone alive? Yeah, thanks to you. Ah, oh, don't mention it. Yes, fantastic work, darling. Now we can add blowing up half of Parliament to the increasingly long list of reasons we'll be wanted for arrest. Love the optimism. Do you think Ariadne's dead? Nah, she's probably just in one of the other sub-basements licking her wounds. I doubt that was the last we'll see of her. We're not nearly that lucky. Then maybe it would be wise to take a little holiday out of the country before she'll be able to track us down again. I like your thinking. Where did you park? Just over... here. Shit. While Ariadne was unaccounted for, it bears remembering that there were still many more parties in Valor who had quarrel with Aya and Winterlich. There was police chief Aaron Gottlieb, who didn't appreciate Eisen being set free from prison. There was Minister LaBelle, who had recognised the Aya and Winterlich van as he was fleeing from the collapsing castle. There was Maxim Moretz, who had been following the exploits of the trio ever since Daphne had informed him of the Kingmaker's presence. And last but not least, there was babyface John Schaefer, who was not a man who took being swindled lightly. All of them were armed, and none of them looked pleased. Do we need to repeat this whole song and dance today, Aya? Ah, oh, looks like it. Don't take him in before I've had a chance to extract what he owes me, Chief Gottlieb. Likewise. I want to get a couple good licks in before you haul him off to the clink. And don't forget to add destruction of government property and armed robbery to their list of charges. Ison, can't you take their guns? I am barely holding it together, Colette. I couldn't lift a sewing needle if I wanted to. So what do we do? Parley, gentlemen? This episode of the Kingmaker Histories was written and audio engineered by Meg Malloy Tutin, with executive production by Henry Galley. Our music comes courtesy of Vivek Abhishek. This episode featured, in order of appearance, David Alt as the historian, Josh Rubino as Telesphore, Blythe Renee as Colette, Takai Nazir as Eisen, Will Dorenzi Martin as Axel, BK Dawson as Gottlieb, Kat Walker Shea as Melena, Addison Peacock as Ariadne, Zane Schacht as Leonid and Minister LaBelle, Graham Rowett as Moretz, and Richie Ammons as Babyface John, with additional voices by E.J. Smith, Jamie Douglas, Henry Galley, and Meg Malloy Tutin. If you're interested in supporting the show, please follow Kingmaker Pod on Tumblr, Twitter, and Instagram, or search for The Kingmaker Histories on Facebook and Patreon. Thank you for listening to our first season, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>